Our next speaker is Dr. Jerichi. He he is a professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering at uh, Georgia Tech. His main research interests include shape memory polymers like activated polymers, 3D and 4D printing of active materials. He is a recipient of NSF Career Award and was elected to a SME Fellow. Today, he is going to share his research experience in multi-material additive manufacturing for printed active components. Let's welcome Professor Jerry Chi to this session. Professor Jerry, good morning. Morning. Uh, Can you hear so me? Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I know probably it's kind of late for you guys, uh, but still in the morning here. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the multi-material additive manufacturing that we've been working on in our group for uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, and before, I just want to acknowledge, uh, you know, my current student and former student. The work I'm showing here, actually mainly from the former students, uh, but we're working on quite a bit on the developing new materials, uh, developing new uh, 3D printing technologies, and also uh, we also do a lot of modeling and try to looking at the 3D printing process, including uh, uh, DLP uh, and also uh, 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 FDM as well as DRW. And certainly I, I've been collaborating with uh, uh, Marty quite a long time as well. We have another collaborator, uh, Kurt Marty, who's a deep lot of her, uh, we work together on the design and the fabrications. And uh, the funding uh, for my work coming from the Air Force uh, Office of Scientific Research and as well as uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, we have a few uh, industrial collaborators, including uh, HP and, and also Northrop Grumman. And here's uh, the talk, uh, what I'm going to talk, uh, the outline. As I'm talking about the background and motivations, as, uh, so it's going to be very, uh, very quick. And then we introduce basically three uh, multi-material uh, printer, uh, printing technology we developed in the past uh, four or five years. Uh, so one is multi-material, multi-method 3D printer, which is a, a very big one. And also the reason we developed what we call hybrid printer by DLP and NDRW. And the final one is uh, it's called grid scale assisted DLP multi-material 3D printing. So our motivation on the multi-material printing is really coming from our interest in multifunctional composites as well as 4D printing. Um, many of you have been talking about 4D printing, uh, uh, about what, what is that. And essentially it's a combination uh, of uh, 3D printing with active materials such that after you print and the shape or now its function can change uh, with time. So that's called 4D printing. This is the bottom shows the, uh, the uh, one, two examples we, Marty and I, we did uh, uh, a few years ago uh, we can 3D printing a multi-material lattice and uh, after print and you, you heat it up and, uh, and the lattice can either expand or shrink and uh, depend on uh, how you design them. So this has to open uh, up lots of space just to, uh, regarding in terms of material as well as mechanics, especially mechanics, how you can use the mechanics to assist the design and give you a different kind of shape change. So make it very interesting. But however, we've been working on, uh, previously we worked a lot on the uh, 3D, multi-material 3D, 3D printer, uh, primarily using uh, Stratasys uh, Object 3D printer, which is a, sort of the, one of the best uh, multi-material 3D printer on the market. But the only thing, uh, the bad thing about that printer is just that you can now do anything and that you want to do. You cannot add functionality to it. And uh, so I think most of people have shared a similar feeling with us, just we love it, we hate it. And uh, so, so now we're thinking about, can we develop new printing methods uh, just uh, by ourselves to address these issues? So, and that's really the motivation about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the talk, that, uh, the work we've done that I'm gonna talk today. So since 2016, and we, uh, uh, we start to build a 3D printer and we call multi-material, multi-functional, a multi-material, multi multi-method uh, 3D printer. So I call M4 3D printer. And in, in this system, we actually put together quite a bit of technologies together. Uh, here we put in, on the left side, we put aerosol jet, essentially can print very fine uh, lines, roughly about five micron to 10 micron lines. And on this side, we actually can put, uh, we leave the space for two FDM heads and two DRW heads. 
And on this side, we put the uh, 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 Inja heads. We have two right, right now mounted on. And in the middle, we call it, a, it's a photonic cure unit. Essentially, it's a, a high energy flashlight system. And it, you have to cure uh, conduct ink such that the silver nanoparticle ink uh, really very fast. And we also put the two robotic arms uh, for pick and place. And right now we also mount uh, the machine vision, uh, computer vision system to the to the printer. And uh, so we have to make the, uh, put the hardware together as well. We put, uh, 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 we develop our own software so we can actually do the, uh, have a very nice user interface so we can actually uh, do lots of printing work. And here's those one example we print a uh, 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 soft pneumatic actuator. In this case, we combine the inject printing. You can see this is in, uh, on the on the uh, the blue color is inject printed. And the white color uh, is the uh, direct ink wrap printed. And so we can actually do this all together. So after you print, and you can see uh, you can do the contributing pressure to to do the actuation. This is all done just in one printing job. Here on the backbone, we actually put the uh, the uh, inject printed uh, uh, layer that is a stiffer, and then the DRW layer is actually pretty soft, very stretchable. And so when you when you actually blow it, uh, it gives you this bending deformation. And the ink we we use actually in this case because they are both both ink are photo cured, so they actually has relatively good uh, connections. So we actually print a a part like this with a, uh, has an interface and uh, on top is very soft, this is very stiff. And uh, if, if you look at this picture, uh, this, we, we do the tensile test, you can see it's very stretchable and we can stretch almost uh, more than 300%. And uh, but certainly eventually fills, it actually fills at the interface, uh, which is not too surprised because this part is relatively stiff. But you can see, you can still see, and uh, you have quite a bit of materials uh, attached uh, to this end. So that means you, you have to have a quite good uh, uh, adhesion uh, between the layers. And also be, the, even the DIW print, we can see we can actually bloat it up. That means and the, actually can, uh, have the, the, the interface actually between the lines in the DIW printing is pretty good. And here shows the, uh, we can do also put the contact the inks to it. In this case, we actually can print uh, a stretchable conductive strip uh, still, we put the two inject printed bars, and then we're using the another. Uh, we're using DIW print the soft material. Then we also using DIW at uh, conductive silver inks uh, to it, and you can see the line now being drawn on it. And we're using photonic cure sort of for quickly cure the nanopart silver nanoparticle ink. And once it's finished, that's the part we obtained. And you can certainly plug in uh, the wires, and you can power the lights. And you can you can stretch it, you can twist it, and so that's the uh, you can see it's very flexible. And here's another one we can print uh, uh, using the pick and place. And this one we print the hand. Uh, then we using pick and place, we print make some uh, liquid crystal elastomer strips. And in this case also put conductive wires. And this is our the liquid crystal liquid crystal elastomer strips we make. We use the robotic arm to pick and place, put them onto the onto the hand, and then we cover those uh, uh, LCE strips uh, by adding another layer of our soft material. And you can see when we heat it up, and those conductive lines can uh, can serve as a heater, so heat up the liquid crystal liquid crystal elastomer, and the liquid crystal elastomer will as you heat up, it will shrink. And so, but if you place them into sort of onto the top, this is actually can drive the whole thing start to bend. So we can actually control, uh, you know, which finger we want it to fold. And we also developed a method uh, using the uh, Dirac ink right approach to print a uh, liquid crystal elastomer. Uh, uh, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with liquid crystal elastomer, it's basically uh, it, when you hear uh, liquid crystal elastomer is very interesting. It's a reversible, it's a soft material that can have reversible shape change. And, uh, and when, basically when you heat it up, it will shrink. And when you cool it down, it will expand. The, the mechanism is basically you have this kind of for 
uh, uh, we call mesogen, it's a kind of small uh, kind of molecules and uh, they tend to align themselves at low temperature. So at low temperature, they can align themselves and when you heat it up and they start to uh, uh, lose alignment. So that's why you can, you can see the shrinkage. And but in fabricating a liquid crystal elastomer, the challenge is that you have to initially align those mesogens. And uh, in a typical conventional way, and people using rubbing try to align the methylgen or uh, a recent approach, another approach is that you do a, a two stage cure. One stage you slightly cure the poly uh, polymer form a network and then you stretch the entire uh, uh, elastomer and then you do a second stage cure such that you can fix the alignment of the methylgenes. So make it, because you have to do mechanical stretching so printing them is pretty hard. But just recent years, so quite a few groups developed this, this approach using DR, direct incorite because direct incorite you can use in the shear thinning approach method so to align the methylgen. So this is a, the, uh, the, our approach. Basically we pre prepare uh, the LC, we prepare this oligomerize. So basically it's monomer sort of crossing slightly become long chain polymers. And then you squeeze them through a nozzle and during the shrink, uh, shrink uh, you can see during the uh, due to the shear thinning, you actually can align the LC messages. And once it's out, and you can shine the lights and you fix it. And by doing so, you can actually can print LC uh, strip directly. Our approach, we can print at room temperature and the transition temperature, uh, roughly, you can see, uh, this is the sort of the, the, the shrink, shrinkage strain. And then you start from room temperature, you start to heat, and you can achieve roughly about 50% of shrinkage strain. And uh, which is almost as, the same as you people make by uh, just by you know, not 3D printing in bulk approach. And this is very reversible. So you can see this one can go, go up and down. And so this is actually very interesting. So we, uh, since we have DIW uh, heads in our printer, so we can actually put this DIW, uh, 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 we can print liquid crystal elastomers using our M4 3D printer. And so here shows a gripper and that actually printed by uh, the entire thing. So we can actually grab a ping pong ball and this is all 3D printed. So essentially we're, we're using the inject print, the blue color is inject. So we put inject print, we can print the substrate. Then we add silver inks. Also we put the liquid crystal elastomer lines. Uh, uh, then we just uh, cover it and you can create this kind of uh, small grippers. <laughs> And here's another uh, way we're using our M4 3D printer. So as previous speaker uh, talked about the peak and those materials are uh, all high performance, but they are only uh, sort of printed by FDM. And uh, so the, the issue with FDM printed is the, the surface roughness is pretty high. So in this case, we have an industrial collaborator and they want to add, uh, uh, they're using print all time, which is another high performance uh, 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 thermoplastic uh, polymer. Uh, so, and uh, the problem is the surface, they want to use in this uh, uh, R, uh, all time, 3D print all time for the RF applications. However, the surface is very rough. So when you add this, uh, you, when you add up using the 3D printing approach to add uh, conductive traces, many times you actually look, uh, you, uh, the trees are not conductive. So here's it shows the one that we printed and this substrate is printed, then we're using 3D printing, add the saver uh, traces on top. And you can see here the problem just like, uh, because the surface roughness is pretty high. So, and you can see the, uh, the color, the black color, you can see that you got a lot of holes and, uh, and they're pretty rough. So, you, so even when you put the silver nanoparticle, uh, silver inks to it, and the silver actually, the trace actually, you, you see this kind of uh, cracks and essentially make it non-conductive. And they even try using the polishing, just using the hand, using a sandpaper to polish, but polish the, the surface. But still you have, you, you, you always find some kind of places that's not very conductive. So really for RF device application, you need a very smooth surface. So what we did here is uh, we, we take their samples and essentially it's also FF, uh, FDM printed. What we did here is like, we first using the inject to add a uh, pack DA as uh, sort of for separation and, and because pack DA can actually bond the outcome very well. So we actually put the pack DA on the, um, uh, on the surface, but pack DA doesn't have a very good uh, dielectric performance for RF applications. So we, we, the next step is we actually put a, a, 
a Kapton layer, which is a, can also be three dependent. And Kapton layer has very Kapton has very good dye electric performance, and also give me a very smooth surface. And after print after printing the Kapton layer, we can add silver conductive traces. And in this case, actually, we end up with a very smooth surface. And this actually shows what we printed. We also did. Uh, you can also print very fine lines on the surface. And here shows some kind of uh, traces we printed. This is actually uh, just a penny. Uh, it's a teeny tiny, it's about, uh, this is roughly, yeah. So it's, this is roughly about, uh, I think one centimeter diameter size. And we also did a um, measurement on the RF loss, the uh, dissipative loss. You can see this is after, this is before we do any modification and you can, they actually measured, uh, uh, the solid line is measured. And we also run simulation. You can see you actually can have quite big of loss uh, of your uh, uh, of energy of your signal, but when we do the surface modification, we can see a very good improvement uh, of the, uh, we actually reduce the loss quite a bit. So now let's, uh, we skip the uh, sweep the, uh, the gear to the DLP 3D printing. And some of you uh, probably know DLP, the previous uh, printing, I think the previous um, uh, speaker also mentioned uh, the DLP printing. And in, essentially there are two uh, type of DLP printing. And the, the reason it's called DLP printing is because really it's a, 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 using a, a, a projector, it's called digital light processing. It's just a typical the projector we, you, you, we use uh, in, you, if you're in the conference room. And so that's why the names come from, but there's two ways you do the DLP. One just you do uh, from the, you put the light source from the bottom and now, now you start to, you have a reservoir on here and there's a transparent window uh, at the bottom of your reservoir tank. And when you start to print and you actually just uh, sort of print one layer, then the state move up. So this one called bottom up because the bottom always going up. The other, the other approach called top down print. And essentially you have a big reservoir tank. This actually derived from the SL, SLA approach. Uh, instead of using a laser uh, here, using a projector. So basically the, uh, the, the material actually starts to sink down. And uh, the, the drawback of, of top down uh, is that you need lots of ink because you, as you print and your parts start going down. So you actually need a, a quite large tank of ink. So the, uh, the bottom up approach right now is more popular because it consumes fewer, uh, consume fewer and uh, 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 inks. And the advantage is that you only have this station and uh, this stage motion and it, uh, each layer is roughly about 50 micron and you just shine the lights and typically it, it is using the photopolymer so you can cure the ink in two to five seconds. So it's really fast. And also resolution can be very high because the projector you're using uh, has typically has resolution about 50 micron to 100 micron. So, so certainly you can achieve, this is almost the uh, among the highest uh, resolution that's typically in the commercial 3D printer and they're using, but certainly you can actually uh, go in down as well if you just uh, sort of zoom Zoom, uh, zoom out your projector. And uh, uh, I think uh, Nick Fung's group at MIT, they can achieve about one micron uh, resolution. But certainly when you go to one micron resolution, your part become very small. But a dis disadvantage that because using a, a tank of reservoir, a, a, a tank of a reservoir of your ink, and you only print one material at a time. So, so make it uh, not really suitable for multi-material printing. So our approach is that uh, we we really like DLP printing, but we just uh, but the problem is you cannot add functionality to it. So one way to do this is to just combine the DLP with DRW because DRW we can put many other polymers, we can print liquid crystal, liquid crystal elastomers, we can print conductor inks. So now our approach is combine them together. In this case, we're using this uh, top down approach. So essentially, we can print. Uh, a few layers of DLP structures, then we can take it out and we can just using, we can write a few lines uh, adding either uh, liquid crystal elastomer or we can add the uh, conductive traces. And then we can just repeat doing, then we just uh, after done that, we can just continue resume DLP printing. So we can do that and adding lots of uh, different functions to it. And what's interesting here, the, the problem, the challenge here just uh, that after the, the DLP, the top-down printing approach, the top layer is always tacky because it cannot be fully cured because of the uh, oxygen uh, inhibition uh, 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 sort of for effects. And so you always, always have a tacky layer on the top. So the, make the printing on the, uh, the DIW printing actually pretty hard because, and the, the ink actually cannot grab to the substrate. 
So we actually did quite a bit of studies showing here is that the, the, blue color, the blue color here, these are the just the, you print on the glass slide. So you can see you actually got a pretty good you know, lens that you're printing. It doesn't matter what's the printing speed. Um, but if, when you print the system on the DLP printed sample, on the DLP printed surface, here shows the, uh, the right line here shows that's a silver. Silver seems to perform uh, quite well. And still, you, you kind of lose a little bit of the uh, the uh, the uh, sort of the lens that you want, but the uh, the liquid crystal elastomer performed the bad, uh, the worst. Uh, so as as you increase the speed of your printing, you actually sort of for the, the the ink actually starts sliding on the surface. So you actually cannot achieve the lens that you want. So the only way we found out is that we, you you need to print it relatively slowly. So if you print slowly, like two millimeter per second. You, you can actually achieve the lens that you want. We also look at the interface between different printing approach. It seems they're, they work very well because we're, the ink we're using, they're all photo curable. So they, have, they both have accurate components. So they actually can uh, adhere very well. Here shows one example. We're using the DLP and DRW print the material. You can see when we stretch them, they actually break, not at the interface. It's actually, this is a, a DLP printed part start to break. And then, I mean, here shows we can print different structures and uh, with uh, uh, different kind of patterns embedded. This actually is it's kind of buzz beads from Georgia Tech. And we can embed this pattern in the printed structure. Uh, we can even put other structures in this lattice structure. And uh, you can see this is kind of multi-material uh, approach. And here shows example, we can put the liquid crystal elastomer inside DLP printed. Uh, we can do the actuation because DLP and the LC can shrink when you heat it up. Here shows a flower, and this is as printed. And when you heat it, it just start to uh, uh, sort of for, uh, fold up, and then you cool it down. It just come back. You can do multiple layers. We can even create a soft crawling, uh, crawling robot here, and I've, as we can just manipulate the friction at the uh, from at the top and the uh, at the front and the rear and the uh, front, and by doing a, a heating cooling cycle. And this, this guy can actually just uh, crawling by itself. And, but now let's come back again. Uh, in the previous approach, I, I still need to do kind of switching back and forth of the tool that I'm using. So this is a little bit tedious. So uh, we ask our, ourselves, because if just using a single tank of DLP at uh, the ink reservoir, you only you need to just pull up your system. So it's really fast, but using but you're using just one reservoir of the, the resin, you really cannot achieve multi-material behavior. So we're thinking about can we using the, the light intensity to create multi-material type of material, uh, printing? And actually, other people tried. Uh, I think this is Amy, uh, Amy Peterson, and she tried before, and when she was at Oak Ridge, and she she tried this. Um, and they just using the brightness of light to control. Uh, basically, how how uh, the, the degree of cure of the polymers. The issue there is that you can now achieve big difference in the mechanical property. They can only achieve the property difference roughly about ten times to twenty times. Uh, for for mo most of our applications, we want a lot more than that. So I challenged my students at that time and said, "Can we do a uh, hundred times difference or five hundred times difference?" And so. It turned out to be, it worked. So here's the idea. We have, a, we're using this ink, we call two-stage cure. Some people call it dual cure. And basically the, the, the ink, you have to cure it two times. It's a mixture of photopolymer with some kind of epoxy uh, crossing uh, polymers, uh, thermosetting polymers. You mix them together. And what you do is uh, using the DLP, you can print photopolymer that can help you to hold the shape. And you do a second stage thermal cure, you can actually make the mechanical property very good. So actually people nowadays using this dual cure, two-stage cure, and to print epoxy-like materials using the DLP, which is, a, we also did quite a few work in that domain a few years ago. And uh, so, but, and what we found interesting also is the mechanical property of your final, just after thermal cure, it's actually highly depends on how much you cure during the photo curing stage. So this actually give us suggestions so here's what we did. We're basically using the grayscale, just brightness of light. We can actually selectively cure different regions with different brightness. So that ends up with different, different we call it degree of cure of your photopolymer ink. And after that, 
we can do a thermal cure. We found out that the thermal cure will not, we, we actually sort of uh, boost the difference in the mechanical property. In the, in the, in the first photo stage cure, we can achieve property, we tried our best, we can achieve property difference roughly about uh, 50 times. But after thermal cure, we can achieve really dramatic difference. So here shows, uh, here G0 means it's 100% bright light and G90 means it's only 10% Right, so it's the great scale is 90. So you can see here, this is my G0, so it's really stiff. And well, the G90 is actually very soft. And uh, we look at the modulars, G0, the modulars is about one gigapascal. It's actually slightly higher than one gigapascal, but the G90, we achieve just a couple, one mega, roughly about one megapascal. So, so the G90, we have six times, 600 times difference. We actually tried even G93, we, we have about uh, almost a thousand times difference. So that's actually, this actually essentially we achieve the same thing that object can do because object can do basically so the tango is very soft, their viral is very stiff and the, the difference is about a thousand times. So that's really essentially we achieve the same uh, uh, different prop, property difference as uh, uh, use uh, as the uh, object, but we're using a DLP, which is a lot cheaper and also very fast. So here's just one example. We can print the pattern in the middle so because it's very soft. So you push it on it and you can see, and the only middle part bent. Here we have a gradient. You can see as you push it and this part is soft. And uh, so you can see how it change. We can also print a, a, a 2D lattice. And so you can do the compression. And uh, you see this layer middle is very soft. So they actually protect the system the structure underneath. Uh, we can also print uh, this kind of uh, lattice structure. And here shows, this, in this case, we have a gradient in this direction. So if you press, uh, you press in this direction, you see the uniform deformation. But if you press vertically in this direction and uh, you see, you can actually crash them layer by layer. And because this, uh, this actually uh, has four layers, so this figure doesn't match, but the idea just like I have one layer that's stiffer. And so you can see, you can crash your lattice just layer by layer, even though they look very similar, but they give you very different uh, behaviors. And because of this uh, uh, big difference in the properties, they actually, uh, you can actually, they, they have different kind of uh, absorbance. Or if you put in the into, a dye and the the, uh, the the dye will diffuse into your your material, but and normally your soft region actually can absorb more dyes, and the stiff region actually doesn't absorb much of it. So you can actually use in the counter for a counterfeiting application. For example, you print a pattern. In this case, we actually put a Florence dye in it. You barely see it until you shine the UV light. You start to see the pattern. You can see the barcode. You can do the scanning. Another approach recently we worked on is uh, using this grayscale, we further expand the scale for the grayscale printing. Uh, we do this kind of for uh, uh, using the grayscale printing of shape memory polymers. And we've been working on shape memory polymers for more than 15 years. So we know shape memory polymer very well. So in this case, we're actually using the grayscale. Again, we're using bright light and dark light to control. In this case, we create two, two systems in the one ink. Uh, the, if you shine light, the, the very bright light give you a, a, a shimmer polymer that has higher glass transition temperature. In this case, this one, let's say about 80 degrees of glass transition temperature. And this one, because it's cured by a relatively darker light, I think TG of this one is about 50 degrees C. So now this gives me a space that if I can heat up my system to let's say uh, 60 degrees C, and my, this material is still kind of in the, will go to the rubbery state because it's, become, it's above its TG, so it becomes soft. But the other one actually is still stiff because it's below its TG. So now we can create, we can uh, create a structure, we can, we can bloat it up. We call, uh, we call it a balloon uh, uh, 40 printing. So essentially you can bloat it up and then you cool it down. And you, when you cool them down, you essentially you fix all of them, the shape memory effects. So you actually have an inflated structure that been uh, you can do, uh, you can fix. So here's just an example. Oh, and, uh, we are close to the yeah, time limit. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. almost done. I'm almost yeah. done. Okay. And so we're, so here shows one example. We have a, a, 
uh, we print the structure, you can see we can build it up and actually pretty big. And also we can control the stiffness and we can also design the patterns. We can actually, when we blow it, this thing will start to rotate, change its shape and uh, change it into even, even three dimensional shape. And uh, then uh, we can also create a, a surface contour. We can print it and then build it up. So, so let me just stop here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jerry, for this interesting talk. Uh, we don't have any Q&A from, uh, but I can ask some questions. Uh, all these uh, shape memory polymers, they look uh, very thin. Do you think we can scale this to a bigger structure, something like a bigger deployable structure that you can probably okay, send it to space? A, Is it possible? Have, if you have a bigger printer, you can do it, yeah. In the lab, we're using the small printer, and so that's the reason. But if you have a bigger printer, uh, Carbon has a bigger printer. Right now, they can print uh, socials, and their printer print area is about uh, 40 centimeter by uh, 40 centimeter by 30 centimeters. So it's a pretty large area. You can certainly do it, yeah. We have one question from the q and session. How did you print with the conductive fibers in a polymer design? Is that a question for you? These are, those are, we print the uh, silver nanoparticle ink that has about silver, about 50 percent of silver nanoparticles. And after printing, you, uh, you, you're sintering them. And uh, using we call photonic cure uh, approach. It's a okay. high, high density flashing light, you can cure them. Okay. Also, can you comment on how much input power you require, like in terms of voltage and current, to actuate your uh, soft robot? Like, for example, in your slide number 28, so a crawling robot, how much energy it consumes for heating? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we didn't do any calculation on that. Okay. Uh, but typically, we're just using a sort of a, uh, sort of the, the the hot gun, just the higher you know dryers. Those using that to heat up the system. Okay. But that's a very good question, especially if you're using the hot gun to heat it up. You actually blow a lot of hot yeah. air. So the other approach is using the conductive wires, and uh, that wouldn't cost too much energy because you're really heating up locally. That's what can be more okay. efficient. Okay. Good. There is one more question, maybe last question. How the interface property were up optimized for multi-material printing? In our case, actually, the, the interface are pretty good. And the, the last one, the grayscale printing, we actually do not have interface because they are the same, they are the, do not have interface because they are the same material. The, the hybrid approach, the interface are pretty good. The, the DIW, DLP, as I show you, when we stretch them, they break actually not at the interface, they actually break in another material. And the, the other hybrid, if the silver ink printing the interface, uh, we test it, it's not too bad. You can, they can attach to the substrate pretty well, unless you're, you stretch it really hard. Just in general, because they're all sort of photopolymer based and the interface are uh, relatively good. Okay, thank you, Professor, thank you very much.